we can. Okay, good evening, everybody. Our topic today says uh, communication with children, how to get a child to listen to instructions without yelling or nagging. You know, some of us parents, yelling has become integral part of us. For us, it's a tool for upbringing, but it's a wrong tool, it's a wrong skill for upbringing. So at the end of the day, we will discover that um, there is an alternative to yelling. That yelling to our children doesn't help us to raise them to be, to be disciplined. Now, let's get to the, to the introduction. You know, as parents sometimes, Emotions can get to the best of you. You know, our children sometimes, they can really push someone, some nose off your head. And you see yourself bursting into anger. You know, this is a, is a normal occurrence in our various homes. But then, you are not alone in doing that. And your feeling of parental frustration is normal. What you're doing is normal. You know, because for us, it's, it's part of the tools we use to face our children. But the good news is that you can change the way you talk to your children. You can actually change the way you relax with them. You can actually raise them without making yelling an essential tool for the upbringing of your children. The question is, why do we yell? Why do we yell? Why do we yell? That's the question. Why do we yell? Parents yell because we feel overwhelmed or angry, which makes us raise our voices. But that does not solve the problem. Raising our voices does not solve the problem. It may quiet the children and make them obedient for a short while, but it will not make them correct their behavior or attitude. That's one thing about yelling. It's a temporary measure. You know, for the meantime, they will obey you, they will, they will be calm. But in actual sense, you don't use yelling to, to mold them to help them to correct their attitude. That attitude that you want. To, to change in them. Yelling does not do that for you. And the good news is that you can switch from yelling monologue to a respectful dialogue. What our children need is dialogue, respectful dialogue, where both parties respect each other. You can switch from yelling to a respectful dialogue. And how can we do that? But before we, we look into how we can do that, let's look at the effects of yelling. These are our shouting and nagging. What are the effects of this shouting and nagging on our children, even on ourselves? What are the effects of this yelling to our children? Now, let's take a look at our individual selves. If someone has yelled at you, you will know that a loud voice does not make the message clearer. If your boss yells at you, I wonder if you will be happy. If your colleagues yells at you in office, I doubt if you will be happy. If your spouse yells at you, use yelling to talk to you, will you be happy? Well, the same thing is applicable to our children. If we can't be happy when we are yelled at, likewise, our children are human beings irrespective of the fact that they are still children. They are human beings with emotions. So if you are not happy when you are yelled at, mind you, our children can never be happy when we are yelling at them. Children are not different. Shouting will make them tune out and discipline will be harder. When you are a yelling mother or a yelling parent, you know, you, you help your children to tune out the more you yell, the less you get their attention. 
So if I realize, you know that the more you are yelling to them, the less attention you are getting. And the more difficult it will be for you to discipline them. That is where the problem is. And research has shown that yelling makes children more aggressive. When yelling becomes an integral part of, of upbringing, it makes children to be more aggressive. They see yelling as a way of life. Among themselves, they become physically aggressive and verbally aggressive. Aggressive use of weight among siblings, among classmates, because that is the way the child is being raised, raised on that yelling atmosphere. So yelling makes our children to be aggressive. That is one of the effects. Yelling generally is an expression of anger, which scares children and makes them feel insecure. Yelling makes them feel insecure. Whenever mommy comes, if you're your mother that yells or a father that yells, once you come in, your children feel insecure. You look as if the master that just entered their house. The masquerade is coming. You know, the way, the way children, they are a dread masquerade. That's the way they dread their parents when they are yellers. If you are a yelling mother, you know, you are like a masquerade to your children and they will continue to feel insecure. So that is one of the great disadvantages of it. Yelling does not help us at all to raise our children. Yelling, in general, no matter the context, is not a good thing at all. It has been proved to have long-term effects like anxiety. It causes students to, you know, to live in, in fear, low self-esteem, and increased aggression in children, especially this anxiety and low self-esteem. There was a time I had a seminar with a secondary school student somewhere around uh, Onitra here. So after the seminar, I was having an interaction, one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling for them. There's one particular girl that came for the counseling. If you look at her body, it's filled with bruises. She told me it was her father. You know, this girl, she, she, she grew up in an environment where the parents used to be aggressive. And it made this girl to be always anxious, with low esteem. It's difficult for her to mingle. She, be, she become an antisocial student. So I told her, I wanted to communicate with the parents to help them, you know, take things easier, easier with her. But she told me, no, 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 no. If you call them, you will put me in more trouble. I will enter into more trouble. I told her, okay, no problem. What do you want me to do? She said, I just want somebody to lean on. I just want somebody I could lean on. I said, okay, no problem. I'm here for you. So that is the, the, the kind of situation we used to fix our children. Growing up wouldn't be, uh, a, you know, a something that we want to remember because they grew up in an atmosphere where parents yells all the time. Aggressive parents yells all the time. It is not healthy for our children. It also makes children vulnerable to bullying since their understanding of healthy boundaries and self-respect are narrowed. Yes, this particular girl I'm talking about, because of this experience, you know, the, 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 the school mess always look down on her, talk down on her. She has so low esteem of herself because psychologically, you know, she's not balanced because of the way, the, the kind of upbringing she got from home, an aggressive environment. It, it makes her have low self-esteem of herself and the classmate, they use it as a weapon against her. So it is very, 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 wrong for us to raise children in such environment and such atmosphere. Yelling in any way does not help us, the parents, let alone our children. Alternative to yelling. If yelling is not good, if yelling is not healthy for us and for our children, what is the alternative to yelling? Now listen very attentively. Children with strong emotional connection to their parents are easier to discipline without yelling. Get it clear. Children with strong emotional connection to their parents are easier to discipline without yelling. When children feel safe and unconditionally loved, they will be more receptive to dialogue. That is the bottom line. That is, that's the baseline. 
when they are emotionally connected to you, they will be more receptive to dialogue and can avoid occasion that will escalate to yelling. That is the baseline. When they are emotionally connected to your, their parents. So in other words, you need to connect to your children in order to discipline them. You need to connect with them. When there's this emotional connection, then you know that it will be easier to discipline them. You don't need to shout and yell for them to listen to you. You need to connect before you could do that. So how do we do that? How do we, that is the million question. If emotional connection is necessary, is devoted, is highly important for, for us to discipline our children, how do we connect emotionally to them? That is the question. And we do that. We connect through communication. We connect to our children through communication. And when we're talking about communication, we're talking about effective communication. We are talking about effective communication. And what is effective communication? Effective communication is communication that is interactive. Interactive communication in two ways. Communication that comes in two ways. That is interaction. It is not only you talking, the monologue we are used to. When we yell, we, 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 we interact in a monologous way. But effective communication is in interaction. You talk, your children receive and give you feedback. That is the kind of communication that will yield food, that will help us to connect to our children. Now, the big question again is this, how to establish effective communication? Since effective communication is foundation for successful uh, molding and discipline of our children. Because through effective communication, we're able to establish the friendship we need to hold them without shouting, without yelling. So how do we establish this effective communication? That is another big question. How do we do that? You can establish effective communication through constant interaction when your children are small. This has to start when they are small. Using constant interaction, using storytelling when they are so small because children learn through form. Children learn through form. Whatever you want to teach them and you add some form there, it will help them to adapt and learn. So if you want to establish effective communication, it has to start when they are small. If you are a mother and you haven't done once upon a time for your children, once upon a time, 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 you tell them stories like that, you have lacked a very important opportunity for connecting and bonding with them. It's through this opportunity that we used to connect with them. I learned this particular thing during there's one movie that is called um, Baby's Day Out. I don't know how many of us have watched that movie. Baby's Day Out. If you watch that movie, you discover that the nanny of that girl that was lost used to communicate effectively with this child through reading. So when I saw the way the, the, the baby was connected with the nanny, honestly speaking, when my children were still baby, as early as six months, I started reading for them. I started reading for them as early as six months. So when you are reading, could be story reading, reading a story book. You have a story book, you read for them. When you are reading all that story, no matter how small they are, you are connecting with them, connecting personally with them. So when I was doing it, by the time my students reached one year, I discovered how interested they are in communication. Anywhere they see a piece of paper, you see them holding it and looking at it and opening their mouth and closing, even though they don't know what they, they were doing. They were just doing what they saw you do. That is the power of communication. So effective communication starts when the children are small. You have time to spend with them. Tell them stories. You use all the stories to draw life lessons for them. 
You use all these stories to teach them life lessons. Tell them stories about the events of their pets. Tell them stories about your own life, your struggles in life, what you went through when you were small. They are eager to know. They're eager to learn all these things. When you are telling them all the stories and using every opportunity to draw life lessons, my dear, you are connecting personally with your children. This personal connection is the bond you need to establish good friendship that will make you a key player in their lives. When they are growing, you see the bond growing stronger and stronger. And with that connection, my dear, you don't need to yell to discipline them. No, you don't need to yell to discipline them. If you're able to achieve this, you will be able to bond and connect with your children. You are not just a mother, but a friend. You are not just a father, but a friend. That is the friendship you need to succeed in your parenting adventure. With this skill, you can, you can mold them any way you want without shouting at them. When you are able to bond and connect with your children, you'll be able to do the following. When you're able to establish this effective communication when they are small, you'll be able to do the following. Number one is to establish boundaries for your children. When our children are small, through interaction, through this effective communication, that help us to connect with them, we're able to establish boundaries. They know where boundaries are. Children are supposed to know boundaries, establish these boundaries for them when they are small, when you are still holding them. Establish your expectation, very, very important. Establish your expectation for them. Let them know what their parents expected from them. When your children know your expectation from them, this will help them propel them to work hard to meet that expectation. Many times, we, children don't know the expectations of parents from them. We expect them to use instincts to know. We expect them to, to use their instincts to know. No, you have to streamline this expectation for them and motivate them. You see them working towards those expectations with these boundaries you have set for them. These are the things we do for them when we are able to communicate effectively. Do not see your expectation as a burden. Rather, it will serve as a guide to lead them to your ultimate vision. Your ultimate vision is to raise children that will be courageous, responsible, and God-fearing adults. Your vision is to raise courageous and responsible adults. Then again, for you to avoid, you know, yelling all the time, when you have learned to establish good communication, it will help you to learn to be calm in moments of serious provocation. There are some occasions, you know, that will warrant you're going crazy. You know, you can imagine having a rough day in office. You, you have a rough day in office. Coming back from work, you have a bad traffic along the line. And getting home, you bumped into a house that was turned upside down. A house that was turned upside down is enough to turn your nuts up. It's enough to flay you up. But if you have gotten this this skill of effective communication, you will learn to be calm during moments of such provocations. And when you are calm, you give yourself a time up. Just take some break off and step away from that zone of conflict for a moment. Give yourself a chance to breathe in and calm down. You discover that when you're able to calm yourself down, you will not shout. If you're able to calm yourself down, you will not shout. But if you fail to take this lesson on calmness, you know, acquire the skills on calmness during provocation, a sight of serious provocation, you will continue to yell and yell and yell, and yelling will become part of you and your, and your children. 
and the consequence is white jack. Then again, understand the root cause of the behavior. When our children are misbehaving, leading to all this escalation of anger, you have to find out the root cause of it. What is behind it? What is behind this, this abnormal behaviors? What are the reasons behind this? If you're able to find out the root cause of this behavior, you have to develop a strategy to handle it. There must be a strategy you must develop to handle the root cause of this behavior to bring your children to normal or to bring a particular child to normal. Then again, try to understand individual strengths and weaknesses of our children. It will help you deal with their individual shortcomings. You see, our children don't we want them, but they are not the same. They don't behave the same. They are not alike. Even twins are not alike. Even identical twins, they are not alike. So, we parents must understand that it is our duty when they are still small to understand their individual strengths and weaknesses. Many a time, some of this abnormal behavior you are seeing in adult life, is a child giving their, their parents headache, they sent him to school, he's a dropout. He came back and asked, demanding five million from, from the parents to save up the business. Half of the money was raised for him. He squandered it and came back and went to sell his father's house. You see, this kind of abnormal behavior we are seeing in some children, they manifest, manifested them when they are small, when they were still small. They manifest some of these abnormal behaviors when they were small. It's part of their natural weaknesses, which is the duty of the parents to single it out and have a functional strategy on how to uproot this weakness and plan the corresponding virtue. This is where we are getting it wrong. When they are small, you have to look at their individual weaknesses and try as much as you can to help them overcome it and do what? And plan the corresponding virtue. There could be, it could be a child, for instance, I have a son, my, my, my second son, for instance. He, he is the hot tempered type. While growing up, this boy was so stubborn. So stubborn to the core. He gave me, was giving my husband and I a big headache. He'd quarrel with the siblings at any little provocation. Any little provocation, there is always Wahara in the house because of Chidera. Chidera, 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 Chidera. You know, at a point, I thought it was it's yelling and being high-handed that will help me to bend him like the other siblings. He's the youngest. So I was thinking, you know, this is a verse of the Bible that said, you spare, don't spare, don't spare rod and spoil child. No, don't spoil child and spare rod. I, I tried to cling to on that verse. And now raised my, my, my standard higher by being so hard to him, hard on him, yelling, beating, thinking that is the solution to bend this boy. But I discovered that the more you yell, the more I shout, the worse it becomes. That is one problem with yelling and shouting. The more you are doing it, the more they are blocking themselves from you. The more they are tuning off from you. The more you are becoming strangers to each other. You see yourself living in the same apartment with your children, but you people are strangers to each other. So the more I am being high with this boy, the worse it was becoming. There was a day he, that he screwed the knot off my head. That day he was having issues with his children, his siblings. Because once they have issues, he will just enter the, the house and scatter the whole house upside down. He will turn everywhere upside down. And you have to shout a bit a bit. So that day they had issues. He went carried water, carried a bucket of water and pour on top of their bed. So pour on top of the bed that we used to sleep. The thing got me mad. 
and thy beats, thy yield, and beats, and beats, and thy thoughts beating will, will solve it. So when I finished beating, he cried and cried and cried. I didn't, I didn't look at him. I was cooking. I went back to the kitchen, continued my cooking. About five minutes later, my daughter came and told me more new, the worst has happened. Come and see. I came out. Go and behold. You know, there's this net we had in our doors and windows. I used to caution the bees, don't go near it, let alone touching it so that you don't scratch it and open it so that mosquito will not come in and feast on us. He knew how important this net is to me and how I used to caution them against it. You know what this boy did? He used a sharp object and tore the whole net into pieces. I got out and saw this and I was mad. I was mad. I didn't know what to do. I was mad. So deep down in me, I now say, oh God, this, this one is above me. This is above me, Lord. I say, this is above me. It is above me. And I had the ministration inside. Don't talk. Don't do anything. I just calmed myself down and went back to the kitchen. I didn't talk. When he did that thing, the boy was expecting me to bounce on him like a wounded lion and beat him again. But when I turned and calmed myself down and went back to the kitchen, he became frustrated. He threw himself on the floor and started screaming, Mommy, I'm sorry. Mommy, I'm sorry. Mommy, I'm sorry. Mommy, I'm sorry. I went to the kitchen, I continued my cooking, I was singing. He was crying and begging, and mommy, I'm sorry. I didn't talk to him until I finished cooking. I now sat him down when I finished cooking. And we now started talking one-on-one. -on -one. I don't see why. That was, that was the day he opened up and told me certain things that actually helped me to bring him out of that situation. He said that his siblings, because his other siblings, they are twins. That they used to gang up against him. Every day they would gang up against him. And when they gang up against him, I would pretend that I didn't see them. That is why he used to do all those things to get my attention. Oh God. I said, baby, I'm so sorry. I knew the siblings used to gang up, but I didn't know it was to that extent. It was hurting him that, that bad. So that is why listening to our children is very important. Interaction is very important. Dialogue is the ultimate. It is not yelling. And we have to know that our children are not the same. When any particular child has a particular shortcoming, don't just say, that's how you used to behave. Oh, go see me. Oh, go see me. That is only thing we say. Oh, go see me. You must have a strategy to deal with all their shortcomings when they are small. It is your duty to plant corresponding virtue to those vices they are expecting. If you are not able to do it when they are small, it will grow with them. And by the time they have grown up with it, it will become a monster. That is why you see your children behaving like a computer with virus, because those small vices has matured into a bigger one. You didn't plan the corresponding virtue when they were small. You can only do it through dialogue and constant interaction. Then again, reward. Do not forget that children must be children. Very important. Do not forget that children must be children. You see, children, they have this thing that is called kiddish restlessness. It is natural with them. If you understand, you know that when they turn your house upside down, it is in their nature to play. It is in their nature. So understand that restlessness, that it is part of their natural characteristics. They outgrow it when they are begin to near their adolescence. Once they begin to reach puberty, it's one of the signs of puberty. You see the disappearance of those kiddish restlessness. Those up and down that are turning your house, you won't see them anymore. They will disappear naturally on its own. That is part of the signs of puberty. So this kiddish restlessness, you have to understand that it must be there. They must act as kids. So when you understand it, it will help you to be calm when you're supposed to be calm. It will help you to take a, a, a precautions where necessary. Not shouting all the time. Shouting cannot solve it. Then again, reward good behaviors. 
reward good behaviors. When your children are behaving well, reward them. But don't make the reward to be constant. If you make reward for good behavior constant, it becomes bribe. And if you start bribing your children, you are gone. If you start bribing, then you're gone. There is this family we visited uh, for something we are doing, you know, we need assistance for something we are doing. So when we got to this family, the man of the house was watching television with the children when we came. And then when we came, the man wanted the children to give him audience to attend to us. But they were, the children were watching television. So you now told them, please go upstairs. I want to have audience with my guests. Before us, the children said, no, no, daddy, can't you see we are watching television? <laughs> we are watching television. The man said, okay, you can go upstairs and watch it in the one in your room. You have television there, go and watch it. They said, no, we want to watch this one. We want to watch this man. And the man now, now said, okay, if you go upstairs, I will give you chocolates. That is right. If you go upstairs, I will give you chocolates. And the children said, Daddy, bring it here. Bring it here. Hey. And so my greatest surprise, the man called his house help. Would you bring chocolates for them? The house help brought chocolates and gave them. And they stupidly left for him. That is what I, I told the man plainly. Oh, God, this is not your boo. This is not your man. This is bride. This is no reward. And when you are training your children with bribe, you can never discipline them. You can never discipline them. You will even use your authority as a mother or as a father to direct them. If you begin to bribe them, you lose your authority to direct them to proper direction. They will be the one to decide on the way to take because you have spoiled them with your bribe. Finally, continue to learn. Continue to learn. In parenting, there are three things that are very important because parenting is an adventure. Parenting is an adventure. Number one, you learn. Learning is a continuous thing. When you are interacting with your children, teaching them those things you are you're supposed to be, setting those standards for them, they are learning from you at the same time you are learning from them. Both of you are learning. Both of us are learning. We are learners. We also learn, like the forum we are today, is a forum for learning. Without learning, you cannot achieve success in parenting. A lot of people don't know that skills are needed. That is why we will raise a bunch of idiots. They don't know skills are needed. It is from a platform like this that you learn, learn the skill. While you're learning, you act. You act on what you have learned. While you're interacting with your children, they give you, you know, a, 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 a team to act on. They give you team. They give you topics to act on. You will explore. That is why parenting is an adventure. You discover that while you are giving them, they are equally helping you to grow. While your children are growing, you see yourself also growing in virtue. Because they are learning from you. Those things you are teaching them is what you yourself are trying to leave out for them to copy. You discover that the interplay will help you as the parents and as the children, both of you will be growing. As you are growing in age, your children are growing, becoming responsible adults. The last is prayer. As you are learning, you are acting, you are praying. When you are combining these three skills, you discover that your vision as a parent, which is to raise courageous, responsible, and God-fearing adults, will be actualized. And when you have finished raising them into courageous and responsible adults, they will transfer them to their own children. The way you raise them, that is what they are going to transfer to your, their own children. You see yourself having a generation of courageous, responsible, and God-fearing generation. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Kine Lezenyamu. We really appreciate this talk has been very, very informative. And um, this is now the time to ask questions. If you have questions to ask, you can raise your hand or you put it in the chat box. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, okay, you can go ahead, okay. Okay, is, is someone raising her hand? Yeah, someone is raising her hand. Okay, let me mute, unmute the person. You can unmute. Uh, Dr. Chinelo, Dr. Chinelo is Anyangu, thanks a billion for your presentation. It was very apt, practical, and clear. Um, my question is about what I have noticed, the complaints I've noticed um, from people. You know, the shouting and yelling tends to be more when there is a permissive, over permissive parents. You find that the other one tends to overcompensate by yelling and being a little bit more high-handed and aggressive. So then how do you Apart from all these skills that you have talked about, um, do you agree with me that an over permissive spouse can result in an overbearing uh, component? And then how can you get the over permissive spouse to actually cooperate in the upbringing of the children so that on the part of the person that tries to be maybe authoritative, the, the shouting and yelling will disappear, yet there will be balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I have, uh, when I say this incubation is, um, is um, personal experience. It's personal experience, you know? When the spouse, your spouse on the other hand is the type that believe in yelling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably you understand that Yeri does not solve the problem. If a mother is in a chat box, it becomes. Uh, hey, okay, I'll check. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go okay. ahead. Yes. Okay, okay. I said it's actually, it's always a problem, but it, it is a problem you have to use some sense of maturity to handle at the part of your spouse. If your swing day are, you know, the type as is yelling as, um, as a tool, then we see as being overbearing, so permissive that you are trying to spoil the children. But you know that at long run, that is your strategy that will win. So you have to, first of all, calmly try to streamline things with your spouse. Try to see, let her team see reason with you that high handedness, yelling does not solve it. If you're able to resolve it with him, he will always have, he will always allow you to have upper hand. It depends on how you are able to present it to him to see convincingly that you actually moved through the interaction, through getting connected with your children that the best way to raise children is to get connected with your children, not just being um, authoritative, being um, a yeller, you know, these authoritative. Personally, I grew up on a such, uh, on a, on a such parenting strategy. My father was an, an old teacher, OT teacher, that's what it's called, old teacher. So I grew up on that such atmosphere. And I promised myself I'm not going to raise my children that way. That is 
is not the best. They themselves, who call themselves um, authoritarian, disciplinarian, you know, they, they thought they are doing their children a service, but it's actually a disservice because they know nothing about their children. I tell you, my father don't know anything about me. He may claim to have raised me, but he didn't know anything about me. So I promised myself not to do that to my children. So when I discovered that my husband was, on the other hand, that kind of father I have, I have to come in to explain to him why I wouldn't want to raise my children that way. And thank God it worked out. So try to explain to him, to understand, if you are able to convince him, he will let you have upper hand. He will let you have upper hand. And at the end of the day, you, the, the whole family will be happy because you end up raising children that will be connected to their parents. Your discipline will be the order of the day. Thank you. Then what's the next question? Hello? Hello? Um, the next question, um, I'm trying to read from the chat. Okay. Um, in a situation where yelling has been used and the effect you identify as a low self-esteem is noticeable, what remedial action can the parents use to start reversing the effect? In a situation where yelling had been used and the effect you identified such a low, you, you identified as low self-esteem is not, noticeable, what remedial action can the parents use to start reversing the effect? The, the only remedy, there is only remedy is still that communication. It depends on the age of the children. The age of the children will determine the kind of communication strategy you will use. Like I said, if you are starting early, the strategy you use is storytelling. Now, if your, your children have come maybe at a certain level, the kind of communication strategy you use is question. Certain areas of challenges you know they are facing, ask them as question. Throw it to them as a question. But just from their reaction, from their answers, you can now come in. You use that interact, that strategy to bridge the gap between you and your children. For you to overcome this round, you must bridge that gap because yelling creates a lot of gap between us and our children. So bridging the gap to bring the children back to you, to bring them back to see you as a friend is a, is a, is a big task. And if they have grown to the adolescent or teenage level, it's not gonna be easy. But interaction on, on that level is through bringing in question that you know that is affecting them and allow them to prove a solution, you know, give you an answer. From there, you can now come in. For instance, a teenage girl, you may ask, baby, do you think it is wrong for a teenage girl to have a boyfriend? What, do, what is your opinion about it? What do you think about it? You see, do you think it is wrong for a teenage girl, a girl of 17, 18, to have a boyfriend? What do you think about it? Hey, you say, what do see you? And you will listen to her to know what she has to say, what her opinion about it is. You can use any other, just some questions that revolve around the challenges they are having within their age. Just throw it as a question to them in a chatty friendly way. So from the answers they give you, you can now come in. Coming in like that will help you to establish a good communication rapport between you and them. From there, you can rewrite your wrong. From there, you can rewrite your wrong. First is to bridge the gap. From bridging the gap, you can do the, the, the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another question is, I have older children. Are there some specific strategies for them? Okay, I think probably you've answered it in the earlier question. You said the, the, uh, at a younger age, you use uh, storytelling 
and then at an older age, you use the questioning, yeah. right? Okay, so I think you've answered that question. That is a strategy. So that means as a parent, the, the parent needs to look within herself and study the situation with that child and bring possible questions that would help the child have better insight yeah. to her behavior. Okay, so how do you, how do those in rural areas get this message? Most mothers tend to yell and talk aggressively to their children. How do we that can push that? It says, how do these in how do those in rural areas areas okay. get this message? Okay. <laughs> I mean, we are online. So I think we we if we have if we have how can they get this message about not yelling? In a way, as an NGO, yeah, that's... we personally, I have done a lot of um, grassroots sensitization on what I call full-time parenting strategy, using vernaculars that suit them. So this uh, sensitization during meetings in what we do to help them understand that trends are changing. So it's through meetings that will sensitize them, help them understand the importance of this communication. Because in the years back, you discover that it is actually our parents in the rural area that understand the meaning of this communication we are talking about. That the ones that spend time in interaction with their children, telling their stories, that bonding with children existed in those days with, with our, our, our grandparents in those days. That is why many a time, so many times it's common with grandmother. But young mothers, they send their children to their grandmothers to tell their stories. So those in rural areas, if they could understand that what our new children need is effective communication to bond with us, to bond with them. It will also help them to raise courageous and responsible children. So what is important is packaging the message and communicating, communicating it to them in a manner they will understand, which I know for some years I've been doing this. And we who also understand what it means to learn and act and pray, we can also join to sensitize and carry everybody along. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. So, the, and the next question is in a situation where yelling had been used, okay. Okay, I think you've answered this question. And um, the next question is, I have a six year old that is always complaining about everything. How do I get him to stop complaining too much so that I can take his complaints serious? Because I end up yelling and shushing him not even listening anymore because it becomes repetitive. Okay, you have a child that complains about everything. Is yes, a, a six-year-old. Eh? A six-year-old. A six-year-old. A six-year-old that, is, complains that is about, about everything. That complaint will be one of his shortcomings. That complaint will be one of his shortcomings. So what do you have to do? single him out on his own and ask him why do you, you complain about this you complain about that you complain about it help him understand that complaints on his own it's not a good habit have you tried to explain it to him help him understand that complaints all the time you complain of this you complain of that you complain of this that it is not a good thing so if the child understand first of all that always complaining about this, complaining about that, complaining about that, it will help him to, first of all, adjust. Then look into his complaints. And you should understand as a mother that this could be probably that his shortcoming. Don't give up on that his complaint. Always pay attention there and see where to help him. Remind him, complain. You always complain. You complain about this. You complain about this. You complain. Why do you always? Why? always complaining. Okay? If you help him to understand that this complaint is actually getting on your nerves, it will help you to bear some. 
to help you to start hearing some, knowing that life is all about hearing some short, uh, some inconveniences. Then on your own, you try to look into some of the complaints he's, uh, he's complaining. And the one you looked into, if he complains about the other one, you will now draw his attention. Remember, you complain about the other one for the other day, and I did it. So why are you complaining about this one again? That's why I say you always complain. You should learn to stop. So if you come down and help you one step at a time, your duty is to help that child to come out of that situation. Note it down as one of his greatest shortcomings, which it is your duty to help him draw him out of that. I hope you understand what I explained. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, like add something to this question. In a case, can he also, pro um, also provide solutions to his, um, to th those complaints? If, does he help? Can you? Can he provide solutions to those complaints? Can he, if you make him more involved in yes. so finding solution to his problems, um, yes. Yeah, the ones you can find solutions to you do. The ones you can explain to him that this one cannot work for now. Yeah, you provide solutions for the ones you can. What if this I said I want to go and say to my grandmother in the village? There's something like that. I'm missing grandma. I want to go to see grandma. Something like that. You know, the ones you can provide solutions for, you do that. The ones you cannot, you explain to the child why you cannot do this for that. He, for now, he will understand you. If you explain to him in the manner and the language, he will understand. He will know that you, for now, you cannot provide this. And this is the most you can do for now. You know, when we are very open to our children, they really understand us. I'm telling you from the experience, they really understand us and they will always be there, there to listen to us when we explain to them in the language they will understand. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question from Ginika Okiche says, my question is in a case where correcting a child without yearly and the child is not changing positively and keeps re repeating the same correction. When can one do, what can one do to help such situation? Good. You keep on correcting and the child is not changing. That is where, where God wants you to learn perseverance and patience. You understand? That is where God wants you to develop virtue of perseverance and patience. He said, the child is here for a purpose for you. So learn to persevere. Keep on correcting. Keep on correcting. And it's love. Not only correcting, have one-on-one -on -one dialogue. There's what I, what I call heart-to-heart -heart dialogue with children. You know, in, therapy, in conscience development, if you're able to situate God in the conscience of your children, when this gets difficult like this, you sit the child down one-on-one -on -one and tell him, you are a child of God. This thing you're doing, I want to raise you to be a good child of God. But this attitude is speaking of the wise. When you try to connect to the conscience of the child, the child has already seen himself and know that he's a child of God. That connection will help him to start struggling on his own to overcome those vices. So sit in one on one and connect to his conscience. Let him know that as a child of God, the same thing you are doing, it won't help you to be a good child of God. When you connect to his conscience like that, and what affects him? He sees himself as a child of God who wants to be better. He will start struggling on his own to overcome all those vices. And you on your own will continue to develop that virtue of patience. You see two of you growing together. That is it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chinelo Onwal um, is asking, when you say setting boundaries, what do you mean? And how do you set boundaries with your children? And at what age is it too late to? Please repeat it, let me get it. Okay. When you say, 
when you say setting boundaries, setting yes. boundaries, what do you mean? Expectations, okay. And how do you set boundaries with your children? And at what age is it too late? Okay. The boundaries depends. It revolves around the activities in the house. That we go to bed early by 10 o'clock. That we wake up by this time. That we go out and come back by this time. On our account, should you be outside by 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock? That we dress like this, that we say a prayer by this time, that we do this way. You finish eating, you, you keep your plates in the, in the sink, and whoever's supposed to wash, you wash it. These are boundaries. It revolves around all the activities we do in the house, activities we do in this life, manners. We'll start with etiquette. When you, somebody, you see your elder, you say, good morning. These are boundaries. Etiquette, you have boundaries on etiquette. You have boundaries on dressing. You have boundaries on mannerism. You have boundaries on, on, on divine worship. Divine worship, there is a boundary. You must point God to your children that in our family, God is the ultimate. You set boundary for divine worship. So these boundaries must rotate around all the activities in your family life. I hope you get me clear. The same thing is applicable to the, the, the expectation. What are your expectations? That you wanted to be obedient children of God, respectful to elders, attentive to their studies. So when you are interacting, you use the opportunity to emphasize the importance of all these expectations. When they understand that they should be hardworking, studious to meet this expectation. You see that whenever they are not doing well, you remind them, this is not the expectation you, Daddy and I have for you. You can do better than this. So let this expectation be always felt out for your children. Remind them all these expectations and these boundaries whenever you are interacting. That is why I say, when we are telling them all these stories, we draw lessons from these stories we are telling them. Using these lessons to remind them of these boundaries and expectations. When you are telling them these stories, it could be an incident that happened to you, it could be your own mistake, but you can use it to tell them story and use it to remind them of these expectations, of these boundaries, it will keep sinking into their subconsciousness until they will continue to act on it. It becomes an integral part of them. That is molding. That is how we mold these children. I hope you get it clear. This thing is very important. It is fundamental, especially when your children are still small. Take it very serious. Oh, thank you very much. And another question is, how do I get a very quiet teenager to start opening up, though he has been quiet from birth? Okay. Quiet from birth, that is in temperament. <laughs> that is his temperament. He is the type that is reserved. You understand? So you can't force it on him. So what you have to do is to Engage him in conversation. Be the one to engage him in conversation. <laughs> there was a man that called me sometimes about his teenage son. He said he's 25, but he's always naive when he, he comes to, you know, when he meets his peers. A 25 year old boy, but when he sees friends around, especially opposite sex, girls, he becomes, he, he, he normally shivers, you know? So I told him that. Uh, he is a child that is withdrawn. A child that is withdrawn naturally will find it easy. It's not always easy to bring them out. So it's you, the parents, that will always engage them in conversation. Sometimes give him a book you feel that is interesting to read. When he finishes reading, let him gist you. In my, in my own circle with my children, we have gist time. You gist. Me, I gist. You gist. You just come by call. So you can give him 
a book that is interesting for his age, let him read and, and share the content. As he's sharing it, even if it is not the person, people say, eh, hey, is that what happened? You know, find interest in what he's telling you. Find interest in his gist. Find it, engage him. As he's talking, just, eh, hey, is that so? Sometimes when we're, I'm listening to my children, whether I'm finding it interesting or not interesting, I use that expression to give them, to show them that I'm interested in what they're saying. It's making sense to me. It will help them to open up more. So engage them, engage him in conversation, also in reading. He reads, let him share the content with you and interact with him. With that, you will be able to bring him out to somehow know how to gist with his peers, know how to express himself, know how to communicate with others. Thank you. Okay, so the next uh, question is, the storytelling solution, is it related to the point that you are trying to correct in your child? Is the storytelling solution yes. related to the point you are trying to correct in your child? Good. We are trying to correct our children without yelling. That is the bottom line. That is the topic. And we are saying that the only way you can stop yelling is when you, when you are connected with your children. I hope you're getting me clear. You are trying to relate the storytelling with discipline. No, they didn't connect direct. Our topic says correcting without yelling. And I said that you cannot correct this student without yelling unless you are connected with them. You must be connected to correct them. And for you to connect, there must be effective communication. I hope you're getting me clear. For you to connect, there must be effective communication. It is this effective communication that will help you to correct, to connect, and correct, and discipline. So that is where the storytelling comes in, when they are still small. That is how you establish good communication strategy for your children. With this, you can always discipline them without shouting at them, without yelling at them because you have already established a connecting link, a, connect, a connection between two of you. I hope I'm clear. Thank you very much. Um, another question is, please, can you throw more light on the distinction between reward and bribe? The between, please, can you throw more light on the distinction, the difference between reward and bribe? Okay, reward and bribe. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I told a story, what I witnessed somewhere about bribe. Bribe is when it, you, you, you are doing this to, you know, you are... You're, you're using gifts to induce your children to discipline. You are using your gifts to lure them to discipline. But reward is when you want to appreciate them either for hard work or to motivate them for hard work. That is the difference. Bribe is you want to lure them. You want to, you want to lure them. Use those bribes to lure them. You lure. You are luring them. But reward is that you are appreciating, appreciating good work. And I said it's, it's not supposed to be constant. It's something that you do intermittently. It's not something you do all the time. If you keep on appreciating, they will turn it, they themselves will turn it into bribe. So you should understand the difference between the reward and the bribe. Bribe is where you try to be the book when they are near. Get through this near near go where go go where me chill. Giving this thing go better work up near back home. No 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 no. That is bribe. That is bribe. When they here go where they don't even soup. They you know this one's a bribe. You don't bribe your children. You 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 um. What do you 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 must evict them with reward, not to bribe them. I hope you understand the difference. The other one is for motivation. The other one is to lure them, which is very wrong. Okay. 
Thank you. All right. I think um, in the, I want to unmute um, Amaka Okoye. She wants to ask a question. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Ogo. Um, and thank you so very much, Dr. Chinelo Ezanyang, you're such a powerful um, authority in this field. Really very appreciate your, your talk. Um, actually, what I wanted to do was clarify two things. There was something, oh God, based on somebody's question about the child that was complaining so much, there was something, oh God, you said, and then she, I don't think I got the clarification very well from her. As, I think you were trying to say, is it possible, is there a possibility of also probing the child that complains a lot to proper solutions to those complaints? You didn't address that. I don't know whether you understand my question. No, no I, I didn't get it. Probing the child, you know, the child that complains so much. Yeah. You try to, from what you say, you say we try to explain as much as we could and all that and all that. Then it's, I think there was something a uh, uh, raised, I didn't get it well, that, and I also felt I should ask, also ask that. Is there a way you can also, part of solution is, is there a way you can also push it back to the child to provide solutions to some of those complaints, <laughs> you know, yes. to get him to think also, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know whether that is a solution, that is a, a, a way out of it somehow you know yeah. he has to start thinking himself on yeah. what next um that is one and, and i wanted to answer that and then another one again is uh, i really completely agree with you on um, the issue of being very harsh with kids and then because i had i just wanted to share for everybody i had some friends when we were young these friends what they do is that they leave their parents because of the way they were too over strict and the way they shout at them and all that they want to go out they're not allowed to wear trousers and they cannot talk. So when they when they leave their house, they package their clothes, come out and wear trousers. Yeah. When they are going back, they go and change and go back and wear gowns. That kind of thing. And that's the kind of thing this kind of shouting and not connecting with their kids can do. That's because true. they don't they don't know their children. Because when that's they go out, they won't believe that their children wear trousers, but they obviously wear trousers, you know, because they don't give them chance, they just shout at them and everything. So yeah. they just do the things they do at the back of the parents. The parents do not know them very well. So it's very, very important that we also try to. But I like your lecture very well because it's very important. I, I had friends as a child that were that had this kind of um, family, and I knew it was affecting them very negatively. You know, so it's it's a good thing for us to learn, and I've learned so much. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, the child can offer solution, solutions within his age. Yeah. You can also uh, uh, ask him to provide solution. Finding that solution will also help him to mature and complain yeah. less. You are, you are right at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we have another question. Mm. How can one stop a partner from yelling and shouting at kids every now and then? Yeah, I think uh, I have talked about that issue or that, that partner of a thing. When your, your partner is the type that believes in yelling, is try to present your own side of the argument for him to see. Because many times the shouting and yelling type sees you as being fragile and um, divisive and that you're spoiling the children. But when you try to explain to him very well, convincingly, he will support them and let you have the upper hand in the upbringing of the children because he will not trust your strategy. It's a personal strategy. These are various strategies. We all have our strategy. But your own strategy, you, you believe this is what is good for our children. So try to explain to him convincingly so that he will not you know, see you as being so soft. Uh, so explain to them, explain to your spouse with convincing uh, facts and points. He will always lay it down. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. All right. Some people said they would like to have the slide. Some people said they would like to have the slide while I go down. It's okay. okay. Um, I would like to also let you people know that um, this is Ezayao has a YouTube channel. Can you tell us a bit about your YouTube channel? Why I check other questions? Okay, 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 okay. So that you can subscribe to her YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. You can go to the YouTube channel to get more on 
some of our parenting uh, stuff, especially I have um, a, a presentation there on, on how to teach sexuality education to our children. Because I know that area is one of the major areas we are having challenge. That is an aspect of what bringing that is giving a lot of parents serious challenge. So you can log on to uh, YouTube. My my this is Nelo Tugi. Yeah. Nelo Nelo L N E L O T U G I Nelo Tugi. That is uh, my this thing. My YouTube handle name. Yeah, my uh, YouTube handle. You can log on to that. Then review it and get all the facts you need to know about practical steps to teach sexuality education, how you can handle your children and uh, you know they will embrace chastity as something that is natural and normal. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, the next question is, um, in a situation where yearling had been used and the effects you identified as low self-esteem, etc., what remedial action can the parents use to start reversing the effects? You know, many times some of these parents don't even know the impact. Many times they are not the ones to reverse it for them because they don't know the effect of that they are yielding, that attitude towards their children. They don't. Is the child, maybe when you come across such a child, maybe from that story, the child will tell you, you now realize that the, the, the strategy the parents use to raise him is responsible for his or her low esteem. So it's not always the parents doing it because they themselves don't know the effect, the impact of what they are doing to their children. So if you happen to come across such a child, what you have to do, first of all, is to lend a shoulder and a listening ear to the child. Let him open up to you. The child cannot open up to the parents who, do, who don't even understand that they are hurting him inside. I, I saw a post sometime about last week online we are one girl was saying that I will never go back to my father's house and my parents again. She said it online. It was trending. They don't understand her feelings. They don't care about her. All they know is to criticize, criticize. Everything she does, they must criticize it. She needs somebody to listen to her. So if you come across such a person, is to let the person a listen air. If she sees somebody or he sees someone that will listen to her, understand her own side of the story, from there, you can correct her. From there, you can handle her. From there, you can motivate her. Self-esteem is motivation to help the person believe in his inner self, to know that he can do it, she can do it. It's motivation. Motivation, motivate the person to believe in himself and his ability to achieve something in life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm trying to okay, get further. Um, okay, I think I'll on, on, on my YouTube channel, maybe tomorrow. Okay, uh, okay, so the next question is, okay, the next question is, how can one stop Okay, what, what strategy can be used when you are teaching your child and she seems not to follow instruction but do other, otherwise and guess and guess um oh. sorry and and okay. guess peace it's not following you it's, you're talking and it's not following you probably prefers yes. to listen to the friends you know yes. When we, our children are nearing their adolescent, when they are nearing their, the age of adolescent, there is a battle line drawn between parents and their peers who will be in charge. It's an unseen battle. But parents who are aware of this battle, they're always battle ready. 
and you can only be battle ready through your availability. That is why I will continue to hammer on this connection and bonding. You connect more as they are nearing their adolescence. Your connection and your bonding should intensify because there is a battle ahead. There is okay. a battle ahead. If you must win, it is the level of bonding, connection you have with them that will determine who will win. But many a times, we parents are far away at the battle scene. Once they reach that age of adolescence, you will see peer influence left and left, right and center, tossing the child. And because you are not there, the peers will influence him. And once they have gotten better part of him, my dear, it's not, it's not going to be easy. If we are talking, it will enter from here and disappear from here. That is why when they reach that age, parents sometimes go crazy because we have lost it. You have lost the battle. So it requires patience on your own part. Patience, be firm, be patient, continue to correct, continue to correct, continue to correct and pray hard. Eventually the child will learn. Eventually the peers will, will the, those, those influence will eventually fizzle away and he or she will understand that the truth of the matter lies with what you are saying. So that is it. Oh. Thank that you very it. much. So um, I would like to invite Ijoma Amo to, um, she's um, the, is it the president of NAFAT? No. National, so to talk to us about um, things on family. Why just a brief introduction of what NAFAT is about. Thank you, Mrs. Ijoma Amo. Okay, thank you, Ogor, and um, thank you for the wonderful presentation this evening. Um, basically, NAFAD has this mission to promote, um, first of all, NAFAD means um, Nigerian Association for Family Development. So in other words, they offer family enrichment programs that will help us to strengthen our family. So their mission is to promote family values and strong relationships among spouses, parents, and children. Specifically, um, NAFAD aims to engage in a variety of activities that will educate families in the art of marriage, parenting, and social responsibility and development. They have different courses and other activities like seminar, workshops, conferences, and the rest of them. Now, those courses, they tailor it down to different age category. We have the one we call the first steps. First steps um, is a course that brings out everything about a child between the age of zero to three. So if you're still you know, starting family life, your kids are still coming up, then that course will prepare you to see how to bring up your kids in a very wonderful way. They also have first letters. First letters basically for children within the age of primary school. They have first decisions too, the same thing. They have pre-adolescence. Now pre-adolescence is also a, a course that is um, offered to parents whose kids uh, between the age of 10 to 14, pre-adolescent. Then they have adolescent course. That's when the child is entering senior school about becoming a full um, teenager. So the adolescent course also helps you to understand the different um, behaviors that a child within that age category can come up with. Now, NAFAD has unique ways to you know, get those courses um, um, and taught. So they use what we call case study methodology. So they have different cases. So families can come together and then um, read those cases, bring out the facts, the problems, and then prove a solution. Not for being just stop with kids. They also have for a um, group of 
um, students who just finished university and then they are now um, working. So they call it um, professional. They have um, my life project. It's a course for such a um, um, category of um, persons. So my life project not also helps your adolescent child 